good afternoon uh, i am going to go a little beyond the name of the session that is pediatrics and won't really concentrate on pediatrics that give you a broad overview of what we look at some of the common gait patterns so theory will limit to minimum and try to go for the rest of it so first a few lessons which i read about and i feel are important that bipedalism is the ability to walk upright and that's the first anatomical and behavioral characteristic to distinguish us from the rest of the animal population and this what we call as the gait cycle is what is the basis for understanding normal and pathological walking which contains the swing phase and the stance phase now i think you are already aware what are the phases in this how the limb goes through a continuous cycle from the swing to the stance what is to be understood that the stance phase has two phases of double support when both the feet are on the ground and that's why it is more in duration as compared to the swing phase what we call kinematics is how there is movement of the body segments during this process and kinetic describe the forces causing and resulting from the movement of the joints now these will not be taken up in detail today because that's about how much time we have got today now there is an interesting little cartoon from one of the earliest books in the early 1900s which describes how this puppet is pulling a string to move the foot move from heel strike to toe off this is one of the earliest illustrations of the ankle rockers of how the ankle moves through in the steps of gait now again as of course we know that there are specific muscles acting in each part of gait and the magnitude duration and timing of muscular activity determines quality and efficiency of gait and there are six determinants which are the pelvic tilt the pelvic roll the ankle and foot motion knee flexion all these are mechanisms which are used to optimize the position of your cog or center of gravity so that your walking efficiency is maximized and last is the riddle of the sphinx in mythology at the gates the sphinx would ask the traveler which creature in the morning goes on four legs at midday on two in the evening upon three and the more legs it has the weaker it is now the answer to this was man who crawls as a child walks on two in the prime of his life walks with a walking stick hence three legs and as he gets older he requires more support so he is weaker so walking is a characteristic of your age also as you get older the characteristics of walking change even in the childhood also there are changes in the walking pattern now we're changing the tone we come down to the fact that gait is never analyzed in two dimensions the so much of what we see on videos will be two dimensional videos not the actual analytic parts it's a three dimensional thing you have to see it from all the three sides from the frontal plane from the side and the coronal planes what normal walking requires is periodic movement a systematic repetitive movement of each foot from one position of support to the other and sufficient ground reaction forces applied through the feet to support the body so what we have is a very cyclical motion just like the spoke of a wheel repetitively turning through a 100% circle to 360 degrees where from initial contact of the foot to the loading response to the mid stance when the foot is completely taking support to the terminal stance to the toe off of that one foot that one foot has to repeat the cycle again whilst the other foot will follow it in the same cycle you have two points here where you have the first double support here both the feet are on the ground your second double support here when the feet have interchanged their positions so you have two double support that much extra time 60% on your stance 40% on your swing so this process keeps repeating itself there are some parameters which you need to measure step length stride length stride width these are things which we tend to measure and in actual 3d analysis we put sensors onto the limbs and then try to monitor how each of these movements and parameters change but today we shall not go into those details we shall stick to simple understanding of what are these simple gaze patterns now one thing that is important to know is that even though one lower limb is involved does not mean that the other limb will also not change the abnormal limb will bring about a comparative change in the gait cycle in the normal limb also now let's see uh, we'll see it in the next uh, video which we put up and all of these abnormal gait patterns not exactly in cerebral palsy only each lower limb palsy pathology decides a different pattern of walking and each limb that influences the pattern of the other limb now let's take this gentleman who is walking with a painful lower limb because of a tuberculosis of his right hip you're finding an in 
what do you find in that he has an extremely short taking very very short steps short step length short stride length and a very very decrease stance phase on his right side but is his left limb moving through a normal gait cycle no the left limb also has a decreased step length a decreased stride length a decreased a uh, slightly increased stance phase probably because it's trying to take a most of the load so one limb if one limb is involved one limb is painful some changes would be reflected in the contralateral limb also so not always now look at this gentleman he is a case of ankylosing spondylitis you find a fixed pelvic obliquity there an abduction external rotation deformity of his right lower limb he is walking with a wide base gait so his uh, the width is greater he has got a stiff hip he is hardly moving his hips but he is walking relatively fast his cadence is good he is walking at a pretty average speed so this both are hip pathologies both are painful hips but the pattern is different his opposite limb tends to move almost normally now this is a video which i have taken from this site from the university of utah he is a gentleman he is demonstrating to you a high stepping gait with a foot drop his foot there is no dorsiflexor power see how he flexes his knee to clear the ground there is not really a toe off or a heel strike both of these are absent he is lifting his leg he is flexing his hip flexing his knee to clear the foot off the ground here it's a bilateral pathology that he is trying to demonstrate to you now let's take a look at how this manifests on this child pardon me for that the opd was quite dark i had to light lighten it look at his left lower limb he is doing exactly the same the right is normal this is a post injection palsy okay now we look at a hemiparetic now in a hemiparetic you would find the upper limb on the same side also has to compensate in the same way what is classically demonstrated as a circumduction gait the foot is not really leaving the ground he is dragging the foot and circumducting it to take the next step the opposite limb also correspondingly takes a shorter step see the way he takes a hardly any knee flexion circumducts the limb and comes to the ground right okay even the turning is a shuffle look at the upper limbs upper limb is flexed at the elbow pronated at the forearm flexed at the fingers classical hemiparetic and that's on the real thing you can see the repetition of the same he is partially treated he is undergoing therapy so you would not find so much of circumduction in him note the position of the upper limb now to look at a spastic diplegic a crouch flexion at the hips and the knees a little bit of adduction some rotation at the feet now it's not right to classically demonstrate buddhi the crouch or a jump but uh, tends to any slouches forward shifts the center of gravity a bit forward and then shuffles forward is a classically in a diplegic and taking off the audio here otherwise i'll have nothing to do you are free to go to the site i put up the site there videos are free to download with that with the descriptions okay now if you look at it in the patient now forget this quality of this video way back in 2006 my first digital camera <laughs> so this again a partially treated boy again a diplegic now when you do take a videos i learned later that you need a bit more space to take these videos i didn't have that much space at the time you need a bit more space you need a open space to observe the child ideally take from the frontal plane as well as take a look at him from the side combine the two and then analyze it at your time when you give him a brace pattern is now walks with more or less slightly better you give him a stick he walks almost uh, without support now coming to the trendelenburg gate i think yesterday there was a very nice discussion on 
the biomechanics of this which i really don't want you to see uh, what i want you to say this boy has been very kind enough to take off all his clothes and do the gate for me <laughs> and uh, you can see the pelvis drop on his right and the way he lurches see the pelvis drop on the right as he lurches on his left and how his spine goes to the, the left classical trendelenburg as he weight bears on the normal limb the pelvis drops to the opposite side center of gravity goes towards the right and then he shifts his spine back towards the same side so that his center of gravity is shifted back now that is a trendelenburg gait in a hip pathology it's a child now let's take a look at a slightly different pathology producing a mixture of gait patterns here He is a gentleman who has undergone a surgery for L4-5 and L5-S1 disc. Has a failed back because of a missed fragment. Has a left-sided partial dorsiflexor weakness, as well as an abductor and extensor weakness around the hip. That is L5 root weakness. So what you are seeing is some amount of antalgia on that side. Taking a very careful, measured step. but if you look at his pelvis you see it dropping and him tilting towards the left he has a trendelenburg also he is listing to one side <coughs> it's not necessary you may have a clear cut thing now bilateral septic hips now when you have a this kind of a, bilateral hip pathology with bilateral proximally migrated trochanter bilateral coxa vara she is having a bilateral trendelenburg gait she is moving from side to side but what is different here is hyperextension you can see her hyperextending her back is you classically would you see when there is a gluteus maximus weakness one side she tends to go backwards especially when she is wearing weight on the left okay and lastly non orthopedic gait just for completion because gait is controlled from the cortex in a parkinson's disease it's classically called the parkinsonian shuffle there is a stoop not a crouch a stoop what you call in a diplegic is a crouch he is stooping he plants his feet firmly on the ground has an intention tremor and shuffles and what is very typically seen with a parkinson's uh, gait is that the speed increases as he walks it doesn't increase his uh, step length but as he walks his speed increases and then he comes to a stop and then he will slowly slowly shuffle around to turn so that's how a patient with a parkinson's disease walk that is a hypokinetic or parkinsonian gait as opposed to this you get a hyperkinetic gait in choreo athetoid patients in which there are involuntary movements with every attempted contraction so a little extreme demonstration in this because so much of the choreoathetoids we see are not much able to walk but if they are able to walk they tend to create this rotational involuntary movements almost comical but surprisingly they do not fall they do not fall and the intensity of these movements tends to increase as they walk faster i think i have well exceeded my time because of using a different computer the timer is not there so i think i'll stop here thank you and i think sir uh, this is for dr jori i think he had talked about the elis test so we have a spastic hemiplegic here with equinus and uh, i think so some of the tests which sir said are demonstrated here i just uh, may i sir yeah this is uh, just uh, the duncan elis i was planning on skipping this but since i spoke about it i thought let me just go through it that's the duncan elis test actually you must hold the pelvis well and uh, wait wait for this you can see the pelvis just lifting off there you can see the pelvis just lifting off as the hip is flexed see 
See the pelvis just lifting off. Your silver scales. Okay, we stop at that. Thank you.